Welcome, everybody. It is the most wonderful Wednesday of every month. It is Webinar Wednesday, hosted by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Woo! Yay! It's Webinar Wednesday. As you can tell, I am excited. Uh, we're talking about concrete, rest concrete repair and um, waterproofing today. Uh, this is the second installment of the uh, parking structure preservation series. As you might know, last year we covered off bridge preservation with 12 individual webinars. Uh, and today, or and today, this is the second installment of the parking structure series. So without further ado, let's get moving. Uh, if you've joined us before, you know that the Concrete Preservation Alliance uh, is a, a coalition of organizations that are committed to advancing uh, the best practices in the field of concrete preservation and infrastructure renewal. Uh, we draw on all of our member organizations uh, seen here, seen here, uh, to get uh, speakers and expertise uh, to share with all of you. So today we have uh, Mr. Jeff Jezzard here from Vector Corrosion, Vector Construction here at the bottom left of your screen. And if you found your way here today, you've probably been to the We Save Structures website, where which is the home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Uh, and if you go to the events page there, as you can see highlighted at the top. There are two tabs, one for the bridge preservation series and one for the parking structure series. Here you'll see all the upcoming webinars listed uh, for the parking structure series and all the past um, recordings as well as, as slide decks from all the past speakers, both for the bridge preservation series and for the one parking structure webinar we had last month. So return here regularly uh, to register for more events or if you want to refer back to an old presentation. So uh, before we, we turn forward here, just a challenge to you. When you ask questions in the function, in the chat function um, in the Teams Live event here, um, please put your name in there as well so we know who you are, because I am offering up a, uh, a Amazon or equivalent gift card to the best question that's asked today. And that the best question is defined by, by Jeff, and Jeff will pick the one he liked the best and we'll mail you uh, an Amazon gift card. So it's a pretty good deal. I encourage you to ask lots of questions. Speaking of Jeff, here's his smiley face. As I said, he's a, he's a happy guy and he's got lots of experience to share. He's the Vice President of Business Development for Vector Construction. Uh, as I mentioned before, Vector Construction specializes in concrete restoration and corrosion protection. He has over 30 years of experience. So he's been doing this a very long time and I wanna hear what he has to say. And his educational background is in specifically management, and that's helped him to, uh, to grow the U.S. construction divisions and the business development team he works with now. So he's going to be speaking to us about concrete repair and waterproofing, and uh, he slipped in one extra bullet point there for crack injection and joint repairs, which is goes part and parcel with um, parking structure restoration. So uh, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Are you are you ready to rock and roll there, buddy? I'm ready. Can you hear me, Scott? I can hear you great. As Scott mentioned, today's webinar topic is concrete repair and protection for parking structures. Last month, Dr. Brian Pales spoke about assessments and testing of parking structures, and today we'll talk about doing the actual repairs. If you didn't catch Brian's presentation, it is on the We Save Structures website. Today we will hit on topics such as concrete repair fundamentals, methods and material selection, crack and joint repairs, and waterproofing. Some of the info um, concreters may seem a little basic, but hopefully everyone can gain something out of the presentation. So here we go. Uh, so I really want to start off the day with some safety. Obviously we can't talk safety, this would take all day, but I just wanted to put this slide here because safety should always be job one in everything we do. Uh, the construction industry is one of the most dangerous industries, so working safely, wearing proper PPE, and following safety procedures should always be a top priority. As you can see here, following OSHA standards, reviewing SDSs, that's a big deal today with the big silica plans that are in place and using equipment in good working order with all the guards. Uh, in the picture here, we actually show some ergonomically correct um, an apparatus that actually helps us chip. It's a zero G arm, which holds the chipping hammer up as the employee it takes all the stress off the employee's shoulders and back so we can do overhead chipping. Just a, one of the new technologies to help us work safer and be better on our bodies. So obviously getting ourselves and our employees home safely to their family and friends should be the main goal at every workplace. Uh, here we go. Another thing I wanted to mention before talking about concrete repairs was maintenance. A good maintenance program can eliminate unexpected repair costs and help extend the life of your structures. This is no different than changing the oil in your car or changing your furnace filter at home. 
taking care of your things and they will last longer. Parking structures are exposed to severe conditions and environments which can cause severe damage to the concrete and structure. Regular cleaning, inspections and repairs will keep garages in good condition and help identify issues before they become major problems. Just this insert here is a picture of an inspection report that's posted in the parking, uh, one of the parking magazines I'll show in a few minutes. Um, these are good lists to follow. They just talk about things you should inspect and when and, and how. So using something like this as a checklist can really help you with your maintenance program inspection. I had this slide as a side note just to show the importance of having a good maintenance and cleaning program. Not only will routine maintenance keep your structure in good condition, it will keep, it will help with the cleanliness of the parking area, which obviously has a visual impact on the people who use it. I know when, when I walk into somewhere with a faulty and crumbling parking garage, I start to wonder about who owns it and what's going on there. And here I just attached a few references if anyone wants more information, uh, more information on maintenance programs. Um, ICRI has a really good one, Effective Repair and Maintenance. The National Parking Association has a manual. It's a really thick book on parking garage maintenance and ACI has some good information as well. See, OK, so here's a model we use a vector to ensure we do our repairs properly. It basically walks through the steps in a good concrete repair as you can see, it starts with identifying issues. Um, if you're doing an inspection, you start seeing cracks, spalls, D-lambs, deflection. It's probably encouraging you to do some kind of evaluation, um, whether you bring in someone professionally to do that, or an engineer, a contractor. You can do some non-destructive testing or some cores or destructive testing. Typically, this just helps you determine the root cause of what's going on, and then that helps you decide what to do. Do you just need to monitor, do some maintenance, is this thing too old? Do I need to replace it? Where we're going to go with this is into the concrete repair process. So developing a repair strategy, completing the repair and then some quality control. Other tools we use at Vector are the technical guidelines and procedures put out by ICRI and ACI. ICRI, which is the International Concrete Repair Institute, has published quite a few guidelines such as epoxy injection for crack repair, uh, concrete repair, safety, evaluations, repair materials, selection, and many more. They're available in English and Spanish and are a great uh, resource for everybody. Uh, the website's up here, www.icri.org. Um, the ACI books as well go into more detail. Same kind of thing, just more of a how-to, more of a step-by-step -step instruction man manual. All of these guidelines and procedures are a good starting point if you're looking for information on concrete repair and don't know where to start. As you can see, there are all a multitude of books covering a wide variety of repairs. So assuming we've already done proper assessment, determined the cause of the problem and chose repair strategy, we can now move on to the actual repair. We broke a repair process down at Vector into the following processes, demo, surface prep, choosing the right method of repair, if it's a crack repair, structural repair, restabilizing, waterproofing, et cetera. Um, deciding on whether protection is needed or budgeted, and optionally adding some corrosion protection to extend the life of the reinforcing steel. This, is a, this here is a picture of typical reinforced concrete. Uh, basically, there's a concrete material with embedded rebar, which is not always, but typically a steel rebar. You can hope your concrete looks like this, nice dense concrete, uh, no voids, cracks, nice evenly placed rebar. Uh, doesn't usually happen, but in the real world, this is what we typically aim for. Here we're showing a close up picture of an ideal concrete repair. As you can see, the repair material is going behind the bar and there is nice tight bond line. A good bond is the most important requirement in repair and takes great, great care and preparation to achieve. Made a note here on the bottom to make sure we select the, the proper repair, repair, that, repair material for repair. This is very important for a successful repair as choosing the wrong material is setting up the repair for failure. That being said, there are quite a few things to consider when selecting the right material for your repair. Typically, you want to find a material that is the most compatible with the existing material or structure. Say you have a, you're repairing a 4,000 PSA concrete slab, you don't need 10,000 PSI epoxy mortar. Just find a comparable, compatible material. If the repair is overhead, then you might need a material that is lighter and hangs better. So as you can see here, the location of the repair can also dictate what type of repair and material you need. 
you know, if you have something overhead like this, you might trowel apply something. If you have something on a, ver a vertical, you may spray apply or form and pour. And something down here on a, on a slab, you may just do conventional concrete placement. So also you need to consider what kind of environment the structure is exposed to. If you're in a high traffic area on a parking garage that sees the icing salt, a denser material with low chloride permeability that won't shrink might be preferred, or you could use typical concrete, but then maybe protect it with the coating. So many considerations, obviously. Another important thing is how much time you have to do the repair. If you need to do repairs on the weekend or a shutdown and need the parking garage open Monday, you may need to use a rapid setting material that sets in hours. So we also need to keep in mind that there's a big difference between the process and materials used in new construction compared to the repair world. In new construction, you're more focused on slumps, strengths, uh, water and air content to get the best concrete for your project. In repair, we are more focused on the bond required for the new material and the compatibility with the existing structure. I've worked with uh, many engineers in the past whose background has been in building structures and pouring new concrete, and they have never dealt much with the repair world. There's no judgment here, they just weren't familiar with all the options available for re repair materials, and there are a lot. So we spent a decent, decent amount of time on materials, but it's such an important step in the process. You can see here, it's just a balancing act. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, in material selection. So do your homework. Um, if you need assistance, ask a material rep. They have a lot of information. A certified repair contractor can help or refer to the ICRI guidelines for specifying materials. Okay, well, now that we picked our material, I'm gonna move that dot, uh, we can start the repair. When doing repair, it is important to saw cut the edges of the repair prior to chipping. This will contain the repair to your desired area and prevent feather edging or a thin edge. As you can see here, typically, you know, you'll do your DLAM survey and you'll mark out your area of repair. Then you saw cut the perimeter. So down here, you can see it's a nice clean saw cut edge. It's square and there's no flaking on the edges. One thing we call it is feather edging. If you chip all this and it's really light areas and you patch over that, it would be a really thin patch material and that typically fails really fast. Uh, concrete removal. So basically here you're just removing the loose concrete. This doesn't look very loose to me here. He's going to work at it, but um, he's using a lightweight hammer to reduce damage to the surrounding good concrete. Um, sometimes if you use a bigger hammer, you can chip past your cut edge or else you can micro fracture the good concrete in behind the bad. Uh, also, you got to chip around the steel. It's always good to try and get in and behind there so your material can get in there and have a bond and, and then clean your steel and just the main purpose here is just to get rid of the loose concrete and create a rough surface for proper bonding of your material. Uh, surface prep is probably one of the single most important parts of the repair process. I think I also said bond and material selection are the most important so I guess they're all really important. Uh, a properly prepped surface is necessary to create a good bond for the new repair. Uh, it'll give you a much more durable repair. ICRI even published an entire guideline book containing great info on surface prep, as you can see here. Um, talks about the same thing we talked about, undercutting the rebar, uh, clean cut edges, all that information is in this guideline. Also, the geometry of the repair is really important. As illustrated above, the more square, the better. You know, when you have these round shapes, it's really hard to square it off. If you have these little juddos like puzzle pieces, if you try and patch those, those will break. Also, it just takes way more time. We found in just through experience, cut a nice square patch. You may chip out more than you want to. It's much easier to form or pour or put back. This slide is referring to ICRI's guidelines for surface prep. The guides have great information, as I said before, on the repair process. That's why I keep referring to them. Um, so just another one. This one's on selecting by concrete repair for sealers coating. So it's actually which profile do you need for certain coatings? Uh, on the right here is a picture of a concrete surface profile tag, um, often referred to as just CSP. Uh, these are handy to have on a job site to gauge the profile you're getting from whatever means of surface prep you're doing. So just to explain here, uh, the guidelines contain these charts. The chart shows the surface profile required, required for certain materials. Uh, if you want to use a sealer, you're looking at a CSP one or two, which is probably these first two a little smoother, 
maybe an acid etch or light buffing or something. If you want uh, a polymer overlay or a concrete overlay, you're looking at these bigger CSP numbers, which are these rough, rough aggregate finishes. So you're probably chipping or scarifying or scabbling. Also, uh, this shows this is a different chart that's in the ICR guideline it shows the type of surface prep profile that would be created by using described surface prep techniques. So it's just kind of a guide. You know, low pressure, pressure water cleaning and detergent scrubbing gives you the one shot blasting, abrasive blasting gets you in the middle. When I mentioned roto milling, scabbling, chipping gets you that really rough finish. So good chart just for reference. So back to the repair process. Uh, once you've sounded your concrete and determined repair area, cut to the edges and ship the concrete. The next step is cleaning your repair area. Usually water or sand blasting technique techniques are used for cleaning, depending on what is required and the environment you're in. Sand blasting often does the best job, but is more difficult to do in buildings and enclosed areas. Um, typically, you know, if you're in an office building, it's going to be tough to do either. You know, you have to build containments um, in a parking garage. Usually sand blasting is OK. You still have to protect cars from from dust and debris or water blasting works. Um, yes, a good cleaning removes dust, dirt and debris, but it also removes any loose concrete created during the chipping process, which is kind of what we show here. You know, after chipping, there's always maybe a bit of micro fracturing and, and just scales or weak concrete, usually sandblasting or water blasting will blow that out. If this kind of stuff remains, it could really potentially wreck the bond. Your new material may pull this off and you have a weak spot right here where you're trying to bond your new material. So now our repair is nice and clean and we're ready to pour back our repair material. Before you do this, you may want to consider adding some form of protection for the reinforcing steel. As you can see, there are a few options. These, these are all options to prevent, protect, prevent, or at least slow down the corrosion process in the reinforcement, adding longevity to your repairs. So you can see these options here. You can do no additional protection, just leave the rebar as it is, get it nice and clean. Not a bad option, it's cheap, it's the cheapest one, it's fast. You can put on a barrier coating, such as an epoxy coating on the, on the rebar. You can attach uh, an embedded galvanic anode. So here you can see there's an anode attached to the steel. This gives some nice protection to the rebar all around the repair here, gives you a longer lasting repair. Or you can do a combination of both. Um, about the anodes, there's another area I could spend a lot of hours on is rebar corrosion. Um, this is as far as I go. David Simpson from Vector Corrosion Technologies is doing a whole presentation on corrosion mitigation in the next part webinar of the series on December 8th. So tune in for that. Uh, typically by now, we probably have selected our type of repair, but let's just assume we haven't yet. Here's an overview of some of the more common repair methods. We get into these in more detail in the few next slides. But here, if you look, there's small, thin repairs, which we showed you earlier. This looks like it's, I think it was the side of a building or a silo. Could be a wall, whatever. Just nice, thin, square cut. Um, then we have some larger structural repairs. You know, form and pour, shot creed, gun I did. This is obviously a big repair. It's going to take some fancy form work. And then I just wanted to highlight the last point. Um, concrete curing is critical for a durable repair. Curing is basically the process of maintaining moisture within the concrete to aid cement hydration. If not cured properly, a repair will dry out and crack, and someone will definitely be redoing that repair. So take care to cure the repair and use an appropriate method. Typically, we use wet coverings or a curing compound. There are many repair methods, each better suited for the certain repair. As you see over here, the overhead trowel method, this is for smaller patch areas. You know, if you have two by two or one by one uh, areas on overhead and you've chipped them out and you just need to patch them, it's quick. You just take a trowel and you smear on the material. You know, you can go probably an inch thick at a time. But usually these repairs are only an inch or two thick anyways. Uh, typically not used for bigger areas. And then over here you have some dry packing. It looks like a double T or a beam, just some simple formwork and they're just dry packing some material in here. Um, Easy for small repairs. If this was 100 square feet and this was 100 feet long, obviously we want to look at some different methods of form and pump or diff something different than this. So here we talk about methods for larger repair. Um, it could be done form and pour or else form and pumped. 
either of these methods can create a good repair and usually a contractor may choose one or another based on their experience or expertise. Uh, someone asked me earlier which one to choose and they're both great. Sometimes a pre-placed aggregate may be specified, but typically a contractor will do one or the other based on what they're good at. Um, pumping can be difficult because difficult there's a potential to leave air pockets in the repair if not done properly. And using a pump always introduces a whole new set of difficulties, cleaning and jams and things like that. But if done correctly, pumping can be faster, less labor intensive, and it also creates a pressure in the form which promotes a stronger bond. So it could be the better repair. Better repair. Another thing to note is form and pour repairs need to be vibrated to ensure consolidation of the concrete and prevent honeycombing. If you can access the, the concrete like in a wall form, you just drop a concrete vibrator into the material. And if it's formed up, hitting on the side of a form with a hammer works well. Just don't over vibrate or overwork. Um, the coarse aggregate tends to sink and so does the cement and it leaves water on top and leaves a really weak repair on the, on the ceiling of the repair. Another method uh, being used more and more in today's repair world is shockrete. Shockrete is applying, uh, it's applying concrete projected by air onto a vertical surface or overhead. The impact consolidates the concrete and creates an excellent bond. As you can see over here, uh, they do some, some wet spray, a little less air pressure, but you have a compressed air hose, your, your materials mixed in the pump, you have wet material going through the hose, introduce the air, shoots it on your repair, then guys come in and finish it. Uh, we do this, so typically it's for larger projects. They do it for swimming pools, um, silo liners. Uh, Vector, we do a lot of dry shock read. Basically, it's a dry powder. Your bags go in here, pump the dry powder up, a water and an air source meet at the nozzle, and it's blown onto the concrete repair. The concrete repair sir. So we do this a lot on the side of silos for patch repairs, um, different things like that. Nothing large, but it works very well. In its infancy, the repair industry was skeptical to use shockrete due to some failures. Most failures were due to an untrained or unexperienced nozzleman. With new guidelines, training, and a better, all, better all overall knowledge of the process, shockrete is becoming a more specified and accepted method of repair. The benefit of shockrete is it's much easier and faster repair. There's no form required for the process. You just need a great nozzleman and a good finishing crew. Okay, enough dry theory. Uh, let's look at some examples. Here's an example of a small column repair. I think it's a column in the basement of a party garage. You can see he's chipping. He's got a small air hammer, like we said, to reduce breaking down into here and micro cracking. And um, of course, the worker is sitting down is to not create too much exertion on his body. That's good, good ergonomically correct work. Um, I shouldn't judge. It's been years since I've done any of this. I probably couldn't do it for more than five minutes, but. Anyways, just good, good clean repair overall. Here's a picture of the repair, nice squared off edges. Uh, one thing I took to note here, they worked both corners and I don't know the circumstance if it was budgetary, this was being charged by foot. Um, typically, I think they would square this off and do this entire face. Uh, that would just be a cleaner repair, probably easier. They could have just chipped this off really easy and there's no point leaving this, this little piece here, but that's what they did at the time. So whether directed to or chosen to, that's just a comment. You can see the form work put up. See if they would have done this together, they could just put one solid form piece on here. Would have probably made it a little faster, but all good. So here's some guys uh, mixing and pouring some grout. They're using a grout bag here, which is kind of old fashioned, but there are many ways to do this. You can make a bird mouth and dump it out of a bucket, use a pump. Uh, sometimes simplicity is best, especially if you're just doing some small repairs. Um, of course, they got all their PPE on. We talked about concrete mixing and silica. It's a big thing these days, so definitely masks and your air, air ventilation is very important. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned through all this is proper mixing. Uh, mixing of your materials is crucial with grouts and epoxies to ensure the ingredients are well blended and the material sets properly. So as long as your materials mixed properly, installed within the recommended time, vibrated, it will be a good solid repair. And here's basically the finished product, you know, nice, nice and neat. The side's clean, the side's clean. Well done.
squared off chamfered edge. And it's, it's more this bond line we're usually worried about, which is nice and tight. So they must have hit it with a hammer and vibrated it, consolidated very, very well. So just on some quality control, uh, make sure you have a good quality control plan. It's in everyone's best interest to have a successful project. A good plan will help to ensure the required steps were taken during the repair process, that the finished product meets expectations, and that the whole process is documented so there can be no indifferences after the fact. And, and that's probably the most important piece is documentation. I, I can't tell you how many pro projects we do and we just find at the end, we just don't have enough documentation. If you're, even if you're trying to do something good or you're fighting a claim or you're trying to provide information, document as best as, as much as you can. And most importantly, take pictures. You can never take enough pictures. Like they say, pictures are say a thousand words. Um, anything you do, capture it. The weather, pictures of your, your bond test poles, the repair process. So now we've gotten through most of the real exciting things here. I want to show a few case studies and then we can touch on some cracks, joints and coatings. So here's a project our British Columbia division completed in a parking structure in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, the client had a slab that was cracking and delaminated and wanted to get it repaired. Here you can see the parking deck slab. I think there was just minor DLAMs on the top, but it was kind of hollow. So there was some some voids and they just wanted the surface repaired. Uh, so here are the cracks and delaminations were surface imperfection in the top few inches. So they didn't need to replace the slab by any means, just repair the surface. And in this case, there was enough open space to use, to use a large ride-on milling machine, which made the surface prep much faster and created a much more uniform repair. Um, these machines may appear expensive sometimes when you have to rent or sub them out, but they do demo much more efficiently than hard labor. Like a two-man crew would do a project like this in a few hours compared to a five or six labor crew shipping for days. So as you can see, surface was removed with milling. I think they went down a couple inch, two layers at a time. Just a nice, consistent, straight repair. If you chip this, this would be just a disaster and then you have to haul everything out. Obviously, there's some dust control with this and then it's wet milling. Just a way faster process. Uh, after the milling, uh, do some more surface prep. The little thing was power washed. So use a 5,000 PSI or 35 MPA power wash. And like we said before, this is mainly obviously to get rid of the dirt and debris and grime, but also just to help all the loose, uh, all the loose concrete off. And if there was any micro fractures, it would have gotten rid of all that. So then you have a nice sturdy surface at the bottom to bond to. This is the installation of, uh, they put a breathable hybrid bonding agent, it was called. So it's the, the key thing on the slide is it says a long open time to allow for topping installation. Uh, the long open time is important here. Just want to touch briefly on bonding agents. So sometimes bonding agents can be more of a bond breaker if they cure prior to the application of the topping. So if you put an epoxy bonding agents at one time were popular, you put an epoxy down and if you didn't get your concrete layer on top of that epoxy before it's set, you basically have a thin film of plastic separating the two. So it was a bond breaker. So typically wetting the concrete is the best way to keep the surface saturated and the existing structure doesn't pull the moisture out of the repair material, leaving it dry and weak. So cementitious slurries are good as long as they are kept damp and not allowed to dry up. So here this is, like I said, long open Seek Armatec, I think it was. And here, installation of a high quality. So this is a low permeability concrete. They used a dense material with a corrosion inhibitor. And you see they just rolled it out. It was a bag mix. So that must have took some effort, but they pumped it. Um, the roller screed, you know, standard, they use that over the standard. I think I just heard it's easier, easier to pull, easier labor, not as many people needed and gave a nice smooth rolled appearance. Um, they did wet curing, so the utilization of a seven day wet cure. Uh, they used blankets. Like we mentioned before, our concrete is poured, uh, our concrete is poured curing is essential, like maintain required moisture within, within the concrete. So here, the one thing to mention is the blankets are on there. Make sure you keep them wet. Um, I've seen jobs where people put blankets down. It's a great idea. It's probably the best way to cure your concrete. But if you don't maintain them wet, they will dry up and be useless. So on hot sunny days or when the temperature's up, someone's got to come back and, and soak these blankets. 
So we had QA, QC requirements on this project. Um, they wanted compressive strengths and bond tests. So they got compressive strengths of 60 MPA, which is great. And they did bond strength tests and they averaged uh, 360 PSI, which is also excellent. So just a quick note on bond tests. They're a great way to ensure the overlay is bonded to the substrate. The bond test is a pull-off test in accordance with ASTM C1583, um, which basically says a test method for tensile strength of concrete surface and the bond strength or tensile strength of concrete pair and overlay materials, blah, blah, blah. Here you can see they've done the bond test. I'll explain it a little bit more here. Uh, the concrete pull-off testing equipment consists of a metal disc, you can see right here, epoxy, core drill, a draw bolt, and a jack. So first, a shallow core is drilled perpendicularly into the surface, leaving the intact core still in place. So here's where they've done their core, leaving this chunk of concrete here. Uh, they epoxy bond the disc to this portion where they cored. Then they attach the bolt and the jack, so that sits on top of here, and they pull. So basically, failure can occur in any of the following places. Like, like unfortunately, it can occur in your epoxy. You just have to redo the test. If it occurs in your overlay, then your overlay is, is weak. If it occurs right at your bond line, you've either not done enough surface prep or your surface was dirty. It just wasn't a good bond. What you're looking for is to pull off and see some of the substrate. That means this bond was better than the bond that this, the substrate has with itself. So if you look at this picture closely, you can see the bottom of the core actually has concrete from the underlying substrate on it. So that's a perfect example how the bond between the substrate and the Topping was great and stronger than it needed to be, and just a great job. Which leads to this slide, which is a project completed successfully and well done. So good job, British Columbia. Just wanted to touch on some concrete crack repair. Cracks are obviously a major problem in concrete. For one, they are an eyesore, but more importantly, if water and chlorides infiltrate the concrete down to the rebar, the rebar corrodes, causing severe concrete damage and potentially affect the integrity of the substructure. So here, up here, there's some of these drying cat cracks, you know, they seem harmless. Um, if water gets in there and hits the rebar, it causes big problems. Also, cracks can let in leaking water, as you can see here. You know, it can damage the interior buildings, such as carpets and drywall. So this is why the inspection program is so important. You identify these cracks early and repair them before they cause a major problem. So just the different types of concrete repair or concrete crack repair, sorry. Uh, we have epoxy injection, which is a structural crack repair. It's where you basically inject epoxy into the crack, fill it and bond the concrete back together. You have urethane injection, also called chemical grouting. That's for stopping active leaks, you inject a foam, you inject a, a, a liquid urethane into the crack. Once it hits the water, it expands, creating a gasket, which fills the crack and hopefully stops your leak. And then we have route and seal, which is just kind of a preparing small surface cracks by grinding and then using a caulking. So the three methods we, we use most. So epoxy injection is basically just two different ways to do it. Uh, most contractors professionally use a pump. Uh, there are hand cartridges available and there are advantages if you have four feet of crack in a small room and that's all you have. It's nice to just take some surface seal and a cartridge and there you go. You can finish your repair. Typically on bigger jobs, a, a pump is used. Um, engineers prefer them because they're metered so you can control mixing and you control your measuring and the injection pressers are regulated so you get a more consistent product. And for us, we can buy our material in bulk and it's a lot cheaper that way. But those are the two ways. Here we walk through the epoxy ejection process. Uh, most epoxies are two components that are mixed together right before application. You can't mix too much epoxy at once because it sets up really fast. So if you see here, uh, the guy's mixed up some paste, just cheap cardboard. He's troweling that there's a crack here and here. So we set our injection ports down, just a clear little plastic, basically a tube in there that's hollow. So you sit it over the crack, you seal the entire crack just to stop uh, the injection resin from leaking out. Okay, so here, and then once you get over here, once the epoxy is hardened, you can see here the epoxy is hardened, it's a good seal, you can see all the ports, and he's doing the injection process. 
Uh, one thing I didn't mention here is sometimes before injecting the cracks, you may want to rinse them out first to clear the debris. This isn't always done, but it can be done using the same process, but just using a mild acid to burn away the effluents in order to build some material first, and then you can do your injection process after. So here's epoxy injection being done on a column. Uh, usually injection starts at the bottom port and you can move up as you go. If done right, the epoxy travels from port to port and once the epoxy comes out the port above you, you plug the one you're working on and then keep moving up until you're done injecting the crack. So he started down here, you can see, and he's moving up as the resin. You wanna push it up and force it up the column. And oddly enough, this is the same fellow who was doing the chipping from the seated position, and he's now performing the seated epoxy injection process. So kind of funny. Uh, one thing to note here, though, to, to stick up for this guy is it's a slow process. Um, sometimes these cracks may be very small and tight, and you just got to be patient. It may take a while for the epoxy to travel from port to port. If it's a bigger crack, it may zoom up here really quick. As you can see here, it's just a close up. These ports are filled with epoxy. They start at the bottom, they move their way up, and the epoxy is actually coming out of the top. So here, I don't know if that's a bit of crack or it's just leaking out of the seal, but either way, it showed it's successful. It's moved all the way up. In order to move up, it had to move back as well, so it's filled that entire crack. So just to touch on chemical grouting, which we also called urethane injection, uh, chemical grouting, is a way of stopping water from leaking from an actively leaking crack. So basically, as you can see here, maybe you, uh, there's a crack along this slab. So the foams are injected into the crack in a liquid form. So the liquid's nice and slow, penetrates the crack very well. As soon as that liquid touches water, it starts to react. So water is the catalyst and it converts the liquid polyurethane into foam, which you can see on the top surface. And that foam can be up to 30 times the volume of the liquid put in there. So it typically leaves a mess, but that's how you know it's actually getting into the crack. So it's, it's, it forms a nice gasket and stops the infiltration of water. Um, one thing to note here is, is it's fairly effective. If you can identify the leaking cracks in joints, sometimes you end up chasing water around as you don't know where all the voids are on the other side of the concrete. So we've done some projects where we think we've stopped some water on an active leak and the next day we find it's coming up somewhere else. So that's just one thing to be aware of. So here we're doing a urethane injection on a wall. You can just see there's an actively leaking crack. Here the gentleman's starting to put surface seal on it. Same thing as before. This, in, in this case, they use a cementitious product, you know, a water plug. Um, Ports are a little different. Instead of putting plastic ports over the crack like injection, we actually drill into the crack and intersect back. Um, this material doesn't flow as well as epoxy, so we want to get back in here and hopefully we can get, you know, injection resin into the back, into the void and fill the crack. So if you can see this close enough, he's uh, got all surface seal on and then there's holes drilled on each side of the crack all the way down intersecting I guess it's a three eighths inch hole on a packer and here this has been injected so you can see the foam has reacted with the water and it's gooey all over the place so definitely some cleanup involved here and this also can be done uh, people use um, just handguns to do this or there's pumps that can be used as well so just quickly touch on route and seal uh, route and seal simple economical effective way to prevent water infiltration into cracks you know, cracks are inevitable, inevitable in slabs. Um, when doing your inspection as part of your maintenance program, which we all do now after watching this, identifying cracks and planning for sealing them is an easy and cheap way of maintaining the structure. So basically a guy with a saw, here the guy's putting the sealant in and there's your finished product. Pretty simple. Um, crack and small joint sealing is fairly easy. Expansion joints are a completely different animal. They are crucial to a structure as they allow expansion and contraction of the concrete, but they are much more difficult to maintain and repair. A lot of major problems on bridge piers and lower levels of garages are due to leaking failed expansion joints. We'll show a few examples of expansion joints in a bit. Here's just a few of the materials we use, just a cheap rubber gasket. This is a compression foam. And here's that more designed joint system with with shoulders, this one's this one's very common, but probably one of the most complex. I guess our simplest form is a tube of caulking. 
Um, many types of them. Ensure you contact a design professional, professional contractor, or material supplier for proper product selection. These come in many different sizes. It may seem like a major expense at first, but not preparing or replacing expansion joints typically leads to major water issues, concrete deterioration, rusting, breaking of rebar and post tension cables, and massive restoration projects. A lot of them you see centered around failed uh, expansion joints. So to quickly touch on traffic deck coatings, they're another valuable tool for protecting your parking structure. Although they also require regular inspection and maintenance, they're one of the best lines of defense for your concrete against weathering, abrasion, and water and chloride infiltration. So as we mentioned earlier, one of the biggest problems for parking garages is when water and chlorides leak through the cracks into the concrete deck and corrode the reinforcing steel. So basically here's the guys just putting on a nice shiny coating. You know, some other benefits besides protecting the concrete, you know, it's definitely an aesthetic improvement. They're slip resistance and they're a lot easier to clean. Um, many types of coating options for a parking garage. Most typical coating used is the urethane deck membrane. Deck membrane. Uh, urethane coatings provide excellent adhesion, crack bridging, and abrasion resistance. There are many urethane systems on the market, but all typically offer similar options. This picture is a typical coating for a high traffic area. You can see the many layers of coating, primers and base coats and wear coats and a top coat. The main deck may require less coats as the high traffic areas see a lot more abrasion. So that's just something that hopefully the engineer specifies or the manufacturer will know or suggest. This is a before and after picture of a project we did in Prince George, British Columbia. You know, very obvious how much more aesthetically appealing this is nice spray parking lines compared to this. So this is a quick video of Vector installing a urethane deck coating in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I really want you to notice how quick and efficient these workers are. This is impressive. So I gotta get my pointer out of here. Look at them go. So right now they're putting on the primer. Probably one of the fastest crews I've ever seen. They have it nicely taped, it's been prepped. Primer's done and dry, quickest drying primer ever. Now they're putting on a base coat. You can see it doesn't take a lot of guys. They have a cart system. They wheel out big barrels of material, drop it down and just squeegee it on and then back roll it. Once the base coat's down, they're putting a wear coat on, uh, throwing in sand for abrasion, slip resistance, which they're now done. Now they're putting their top coat on, taping in the parking lines, and there they go. Did that whole floor in 20 seconds. Vector's probably the fastest flooring crews out there. Anyways, uh, there are other options which help provide protection to concrete for coatings. Uh, you have your penetrating sealers on the left. They are silanes and siloxanes, um, basically silicone based that react with silica to create a layer that repels water and chlorides. So here, yeah, you have a guy with this chafing sprayer just spraying it on. Typically, there's a water blast ahead of time and you just soak the concrete, it penetrates. And then you have epoxies as well. Um, they, they wear really well and they're cheaper. They just don't bridge cracking and tend to crack and delaminate fairly quickly. Both are good options and less costly, just probably don't last as long. So here's another quick case study of repairs completed on Memorial Street parking garage in Winnipeg. It used to be the old Hudson's Bay, maybe it still is. It was a large project. Uh, the repairs were phased over many years. So as you can see, 40,000 square feet of, of removal and replacement, uh, new drains, expansion joints, columns, re membrane repair, very large project. So here's another quick video. They did a uh, hydro demolition. So hydro demolition, much like milling machines are efficient. They save on labor costs and the crews will love not having to chip concrete all day. Obviously, these are in the right time and place. This is slab on grade. I guess definitely where you can bring this machine in. Saves a lot of time. Makes a big mess though. You gotta be prepared to clean it up. So here's some through slab repairs on the upper levels. Obviously, they didn't use the hydro demo machine here. Uh, guys chipped all this out. Small chipping hammers. Have to be very careful in these open areas. You see you got the rough profile in there. That's probably a CSB 10. Great for bonding to. Uh, the expansion joints were all replaced uh, using a rubber winged compression seal joint system. Uh, the nosings here are polared with you know the high strength, flexible elastomeric concrete. So here's the joint all cut out and ready. And here's the joint installation. 
you know, here they are, We've got the rubber gasket in, they're doing the shoulders right now, laying it out, and here's your finished project. Nice uniform joint, or that's probably before the, no, that's probably before the joints in, sorry, and here is the joint being slipped in the, in the crack. Job also had some column repairs, you know, obviously this is steel column there, they chipped all the concrete off, formed all up. This one would have been pumped, I'm sure, there's no room for a bird nest or anything, so they obviously pumped these forms. And here's your finished product. Columns look nice, floor is nice and level, and once all the repairs completed, the entire surface was coated with a urethane membrane. So that basically completes our webinar. Um, I did want to throw in a few teasers for our upcoming webinar presentations. I have a few slides of other specialty repair and protection options that can be done in parking garages to help fix problems and extend the life of your structure. So these are pictures of structural strengthening using composite materials. Uh, Andrew Brecker is going to be doing this presentation on February 9th, so put that on your calendar. Structural strengthening is using carbon fiber mostly in park areas to increase load capacity of beams, columns, and walls. You can see here is what they're doing. It can also be used to increase negative moment, which is done around this column, or this confinement of columns, which they've done here. Uh, we have some post tension solutions. So on this slide here, we're doing some testing. It's a very simple test, the screwdriver, te screwdriver test, just to see if this tendon has anything to it, um, if it's loose or if it's tight, to see if it's in good shape. Um, here they've done some anchor end repairs. We've replaced actually these full anchors in a garage in Bismarck. Here they've done a repair with a dog bone. We also do many unique uh, drying and moisture testing. So here we're actually testing the moisture in the tendons and found out they're wet, so we hook up air and dry them. So Mike Curtin will be presenting that on January 12th. Mike's an excellent presenter, so look forward to that. And then concrete corrosion solutions. So here's a few pictures of some of the things we do, some arc spray zinc. Um, this is impressed current in a parking garage. And then there's some anode installation using sacrificial anodes. So like I said, there's two more presentations on this. November 10th, Travis Marm is going to be talking about impressed current solutions, which include arc spray and, and these systems here. And December 8th, David Simpson will be talking about the use of sacrificial anodes and concrete repairs. So that being said, I am, I'm done. I finished early, so I'm, I'd like to hear some good questions. Fantastic, uh, Jeff. That was, uh, again, very thorough. Lots of great content and some great case studies. Nice photos, too. We have a lot of questions. We're not going to be able to get through them all. So just to be equitable, I'm probably just going to jump around a little bit. Um, just ask uh, whatever here. We'll start with the very ones. We'll start. <laughs> we'll start with the first question from uh, from from our friend Ron. Um, I'm going to interpret this one a little bit. But uh, do you recommend the testing, um, the lab testing for every pour and uh, reviewing all the surface prep? I assume that that comes down to QAQC you were mentioning. Yeah, what was the second part of the question with surface prep? Uh, reviewing all surface prep. Yeah, I think I do it every time. I think every pour is different. Every batch of concrete is different. So you're going to want to do your simple test, at least your strengths. Um, bond tests we don't do as much of at the end because that's kind of destructive. So we don't like to wreck the new material we've done. Uh, surface press prep examination is good, which can be done visually just checking for dust. But as far as the bond test goes, that would probably be limited a few, few bond tests per per area, but nothing too much because that's then you have a bunch of holes in your new concrete. So. OK, uh, more questions are coming in. I'm trying to keep up with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your what's your opinion? This is our, from our friend Colin. Uh, what's your opinion on the importance of a scrub coat on the concrete service prior to placing the repair material? So we actually showed that slide there. It's it's very important, but whether you use a scrub coat or just wetting the surface, there's always been a kind of an argument there. The biggest thing is that you need to saturate the, the lower level of the concrete. Like your substrate needs to be saturated because when your new material goes on there, if it's not saturated, it'll draw out the moisture from your repair material. material it'll dry it out and that dry material will be weak and it'll fail. Scrub coats are great. Like I said earlier, you just can't let them completely dry out. So if you keep the scrub coat wet in front of you and the guys are doing it as you go, it's a perfect way to do it. You just got to be aware that you're you're keeping it wet and not doing too much, just enough in front of you to keep the edge wet. All righty. Uh, question from e, uh, pronunciation, e Eli, Eli, Eli. 
Um, I haven't heard you mention shoring of horizontal members, slabs, beams, etc. Uh, during the repair phase, we find that shoring is often required. How often do you see uh, that shoring is a requirement during concrete repairs? Well, we see it a lot. Um, that's a great question. I'll have to include something in my slides next time about shoring. Pretty much any time we're doing, I know that memorial job when they did the deck repair, it was all shored up. Um, most most column repair we do is short, and pretty much any of the structural strengthening jobs we do are short because either there's something that's happened or we're fixing something. So we use shoring quite a bit. I, it's not always ne necessary, but typically if you're removing good good portions of concrete or if you're working on anything structural, there's a shoring component. And if you don't know, definitely have an engineer look at something because as a contractor, we don't always know what's on top of a roof or what's there. So we always have someone look at that just to be sure. Okay, so the brand new question came in that I like, so I'll just uh, ask this from uh, Fen Fenindra. Uh, what is the life expectancy of a good waterproofing um, uh, coat or application? Well, if you maintain it and clean it and take care of it, I've seen them last 15 or 20 years. I've seen some fail in three because people don't do any maintenance on them. It's kind of like anything else. If you do a really good urethane deck coating, and there's not a lot of movement in that substrate, it'll last a long time. Sometimes you may need to recoat, like sometimes they'll put a new top coat on turn aisles and aggressive drive aisles. That may be a necessary step in the maintenance to keeping it up, but it's all about you know inspection and maintenance. But it, like a good one, put on properly, bonded properly, you'll get some good wear out of it. For, I've seen 10 to 20 years easily. Mm, good value. Uh, okay, our friend Rob, um, you would like to talk a little bit about uh, safety here. So could you speak about the types of PPE required to address the air pore and silica uh, containing uh, containing dust during the use of various methods of demolition and surface preparation? So I think you had some respirators in there. Well, can you speak more about kind of what's required? Great question. Uh, this is a huge topic for us. So that's an older picture. You can see the guys are wearing the filtered respirators. We wear full face respirators when we use any form of chipping, grinding, mixing, or anything to do with dust. So I, my biggest thing would be say follow um, OSHA's table one. Table one's a silica table. I wish I had it in here that just talks about uh, silicon. It's, it's actually silica standards for construction by OSHA. So one thing we do is definitely full face for almost anything with dust. And then we use uh, HEPA filters on vacuums. All our chipping, grinding, cutting is all hooked up to vacuum cleaners. And we really don't do much dry sweeping or air blowing anymore. That's pretty much a no-no. So yeah, it's a tough one to follow and the guys do a really good job, but it actually it adds a lot of cost to things. And we like to make our customers aware of that because to be safe and meet standards, there's a lot of things you got to follow. A lot of people are on board with it and some just quite aren't yet, but. Hmm. So yeah, those filters, yeah, that's a bad example. I should put something newer in there with the, the full face or the thing that's covering tiger face, so. No worries. Um, okay, a question from our, our shy friend, Anonymous. Um, what happens after the end of the useful life of a deck coating system? Uh, if it's failing, uh, does the entire coating system need to be removed and replaced? How feasible and costly is this? Can you do patching? Like, can you speak to that? Yeah, so. That's like, again, going back to the maintenance. If someone's left it too long and you've taken over a building and it's run down, typically you're removing it, which is a lot tougher. You might have to scrape it off. Uh, some there's methods of grinding. Big right on grinders will take them off, but it's definitely a chore. It's uh, not as easy as as recoating. But if you if you come to a, a coating and you think it's still good, we've done pull tests and we may clean it, water blast it, or, or shot blast the surface and just recoat it so that we try and do that as much as we can. But if you're worried about the bond at all or it's failing, the whole thing has to come off. And after that, then you have to prep the surface again. So when you're putting on these brand new and they're five to ten dollars a square foot, if you're repairing and putting on a new one, you're you're gonna be up there. It's gonna definitely be costly that first time. Already. But yeah, uh, definitely you can repair them. Patch repairs are suggested and, and new top coats. If it's wearing out a new top coat, we'll keep that thing fresh for another five years. Very good. Um, our friend Scott here is asking for, so for crack injection repairs, uh, do you typically maintain the ports after the material has been placed uh, or can you remove and, and paint the surfaces to maintain the aesthetic? The ports are temporary, I assume, yes? Yeah, I should have said that. They are temporary ports. So we always knock off the ports and then we grind the surface seal. 
that can create issues. So you got to know what the epoxy surface seals you need. Like if, if it's somewhere aesthetic, they need to be ground off and then it obviously leaves a little grinding mark. There are surface seals that can peel. They, they call it heat and peel. Um, so what you peel them off and they don't leave the, the grinding marks. We try and use those on like historic ridges and buildings so they don't leave that scarring. So yeah, they all come off. Unless you're in a basement somewhere, no one cares. But I would definitely specify because if you don't, a contractor may leave them up and say, you didn't tell me to take them down. <laughs> Communication is key. Yeah. Um, so we have, uh, this is more, this is an interesting one. This is from Mark. Um, more common than the question he says, but I wanted to bring this up because it's interesting. You have to be careful with pre-cutting the repair perimeters before chipping uh, because you might encounter shallow rebar or worse, worse yet PT tendons, post-tension tendons, uh, less than half an inch uh, um, of cover. Can, you can actually nick them. Um, so this is, can you, can you speak to your experience with this? I'm sure you've seen this because cover well, is always variable. Seen it, done it, all kinds of that. So. We're, we're pretty good now at identifying a concrete structure with post tension in it. Um, I'm not going to lie, we've broken cables. Uh, as a younger, experienced person, we've cut through, chipped through cables. So now when a building is being worked on, we identify if there's post tension cables. So then we GPR them, we identify them, we mark them, and we cut around them. Or we do, we have tools that are, are kickoff tools, like we have grinders and drills that as soon as they touch something in metallic, they will stop. Um, so that's a, a tool we use as well. And as far as rebar, we're not too worried. If, if you, I guess if you edge the piece of a rebar, it's usually not the end of the world. But um, if you find out it's really low cover, yeah, we definitely have to be careful. And maybe you maybe you just scar the edge of that one and don't you just don't cut as deep. Great point, though. Yeah, you do best, especially with post tension structures, man, that's <laughs> you don't want to mess with that and start breaking those. For sure, lots of uh, lots of complexity when you're uh, when you're in the field. That's why if you're doing uh, a post tension project, you bring in the experts because they have the tools, like the shut off tools and everything. Those things most people don't have those, and they're very specialized. Well, you know what? We have time for maybe one more question here, so I'm just going to pick it random because they keep coming in. It seems everyone wants that Amazon gift card. Uh, mm -hmm. Noel, Noel, here we go. Uh, understanding that there are static and dynamic cracks, so moving and non-moving cracks, obviously, um, that are uh, that require different types of repair methods. What's the main minimum width of cracks to consider injection or route uh, and sealing repairs? Is that a, is that minimum width dependable uh, on the locate depending on location, vertical horizontal? model overhead etc so in my experience the width isn't usually the factor is if it's structural or not so we don't epoxy inject cracks that aren't structural cracks if they're a structural crack and we want to fix them we're epoxy injecting them we've done nuclear facilities where you can't even see them and we're injecting them with epoxy it takes a lot longer um, cracks that are in concrete just if they're worried about in your concrete deck that's non structural crack that's something where we'll probably use more of a you know, route and seal options. So that's where I would refer that question to. There, we can inject cracks that are big, but if they're if they're a lot thicker, I I, I wouldn't say with that anything over an eighth of an inch, we'd probably use a different material. We'd either grout it, or like use an epoxy grout of some kind. We wouldn't use an epoxy resin. Like the the resins are expensive, and you'd put a lot of material in a thin crack. So anything over an eighth of an inch, I'd probably look at different materials. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. There's a couple more comments and questions just about more um, uh, standards and information where the people can acquire information about cathodic protection for concrete structures uh, and uh, and so forth. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, there will be a couple more webinars coming up uh, leading into the new year, and uh, we can obviously uh, provide some of the resources and point in the right direction. So. Um, moving on here, we haven't been able to get to every question, but uh, I know Jeff would love to hear from you. So I'm going to flash up his um, contact information on the screen. Uh, feel free to give him a ring. If we did not answer your question, uh, he's happy to, uh, to have a chat with you. His email address is also there. Jeff is based in, in West Fargo, North Dakota. Um, we have a, a number of upcoming webinars uh, planned. The next one is Impressed Current Cathodic Protection for Parking Structures with Travis Marmon. You can see it on the screen right there. And it is actually posted on our um, on the We Save Structures website right now. So you can go there and register if you're interested. And obviously we did have a glitch in our system last month when we had Dr. Brian Pale speak about the assessment of concrete stru of um, parking structures for corrosion assessments. Um, so the, his slide deck is posted today and we're just uh, working on getting that uh, recording up for you to, to view. So uh, visit the We Save Structures website routinely and uh, we'll update all the content for you. 
That brings us to the end of the presentation today. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing your uh, your time and your sure, expertise thank you. with us. Thank really, you, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all of you for joining us. Uh, I know uh, you know you're busy, and we appreciate your time. Um, and uh, we hope you go out there and save some structures and uh, and take care of yourselves out there as well. Thank you so much.